Wishing you all a very good afternoon. We welcome you to the second day of the NAC sponsored two day national conference on curriculum designing and transactions under the proposed UGC curriculum framework organized by the IQAC of Nirmala College, Muatura. This conference is in collaboration with the state level quality assurance cell government of Kerala. The first day of the conference turned out to be a very engaging academic exercise. Wishing you all a very fruitful session ahead, let me take a few moments to extend a formal word of welcome. With immense pleasure, let me welcome the esteemed dignitaries of the day, the keynote speaker, Dr. R.C. Sharma, and the panelists for the discussion. Welcome to all. I would also like to welcome our dear principal, the staunch support to all the endeavors of the college, Dr. Thomas Kavey, to today's sessions. A hearty welcome to you, sir. A hearty welcome to the vice principal of the college, Professor A.J. Emanuel, who is a perfectionist with meticulous care. Let me also welcome the bursar, Reverend Father Francis Kannadin, who always lends his appreciation. A cordial welcome to Dr. Sony Kuriakos, IQAC coordinator of the college, who is the mastermind behind this conference. To all the faculty members and participants, we extend a very cordial welcome. In the second day of the conference, we have two technical sessions. For the first technical session, we have with us Dr. R.C. Sharma from Dr. B.R. Ambedkar University, Delhi, to deliver the keynote address. Dr. Sharma will talk on internationalization of education. The second session will be a panel discussion on implementation of outcome-based education in higher education institutions. With that, we are moving on to the first session for which we have with us Dr. R.C. Sharma. To welcome and introduce the speaker to us, let me invite Dr. Dinu Alexander, Assistant Professor of Physics, Nirmala College, and she's also the convener of the conference. Over to Dr. Dinu. A very good afternoon to one and all. Dr. R.C. Sharma, an expert in education research, is an associate professor in School of Global Affairs, and he is the director of Human Resource Development Center in Dr. B.R. Ambedkar University, Delhi. He was an associate professor of Educational Technology and Learning Resources in Vavasan Open University, Malaysia. He is an expert in technology-mediated learning and has served as a visiting professor in UNDB, Brazil. He is also a practitioner in promoting open educational resources. We are indeed lucky to have him today with us. Now I invite the renowned academician Dr. R.C. Sharma to share his views on internationalization of education. Wish you all an effective learning session. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, let me share my screen. Can you please allow me sharing my screen so that I can display the presentation? Okay, thank you so much. Friends, thank you so much and uh, my deep appreciation to Nirmala College, uh, which is a very prestigious institution for giving me uh, the opportunity to interact with all of you. So uh, in this topic, uh, what we will see that how internationalization is uh, impacting us and internationalization as we understand it involves the policies and initiatives practiced by institutions and individuals in order to compete with the influence of globalization. So 
this borderless world created by globalization it gives importance to the diversity of cultures within countries communities institutions and allows better understanding of individuals or groups uh, within various communities over the past few decades internationalization has emerged as an important issue of higher education since just a minute i think Okay, now perhaps yeah, because it was saying that my camera. So uh, since economic globalization transformed knowledge into a commodity, higher education institutions have been encouraged to internationalize the recruitment of faculty and students in order to uh, secure recognition for knowledge production. And uh, Okay, let this video begin. And in a wider perspective, internationalization involves academic mobility, international perspectives in learning and teaching process, regroupment of international academic staff and students, and having international partnerships with other higher education institutions. And therefore, the Bologna uh, Declaration, which was signed in 1999, uh, created a system of comparable degrees, supported student mobility, and uh, promoted European dimensions in higher education. European countries as part of the Bologna process are assumed to fulfill the Bologna objectives and qualifications. However, the institutions of some countries, like uh, the developing countries, which are not part of Bologna process, may have difficulties in implementing the processes of internationalization due to political, economic, historical, and organizational barriers. So that is a challenge uh, with us for that. And then the educational systems all over the world have some challenges. These are the challenges of quality, or challenges of numbers, challenges of access, of equity, of quality, et cetera. And here the information communication technology, it plays an important role in meeting these challenges by bridging the knowledge gap, uh, increasing access to educational opportunities, faster delivery of knowledge products and massification of education and enhancing student-centered learning. In educational institutions in that context, ICT is integrated into various systems, not only to assist in teaching and learning, but also for administration and management uh, purposes, something like uh, we deal with student enrollment, we deal with course schedules, we deal with student uh, uh, grading uh, and staff evaluation, etc. Those things, they are important issues in this system. And not only in universities, ICT is used in technical, vocational, education training institutions for creating a skilled ICT capable workforce. And if we examine the adoption and integration of ICT into educational systems, we note some disparity. Some take full advantage while some lack those. And possible reasons are lack of support from the management or shortage of trained uh, staff, uncoordinated planning and implementation, ambiguity in the roles and responsibilities, staff resistance to training, reluctance for retraining, inadequate finances for developing, for purchasing, for implementing ICT. In the recent times, the massive open online courses, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Dr. Vinu Thomas is going to speak with you uh, uh, next. And he's an expert on uh, these things, development of online courses, he's director of IQSC in his college. And uh, my greetings to uh, uh, Father uh, uh, Roy Abrams also, very nice to see you, sir, if you are present here. Uh, happy to know that now you have, uh, you know, uh, taken over another responsibility for there. And it, uh, about these massive open online courses, there have been a wave of disruptive technology with many universities, governments, other institutions, because they have developed and delivered their own MOOCs, including the government of India. We have this own platform and many of the countries uh, I mean, European countries, Asian countries, American, wherever you will see, there are many, many platforms which have been uh, created for this. 
and these are reported to be the next big thing in technology development of higher education and if you remember it correctly it was in year 2012 that these were declared by the new york times as the year of the mooc uh, the 2012 means uh, 2012 that year was as the year of the mooc because they gained so much popularity and as in open and distance education systems these moocs they also reflect the move towards openness in learning that is uh, quite a, 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 a important development and as we have already seen that online and open and distance education systems these are very successful models to serve educational needs of the masses in so on a larger scale how we can scale up and these are effective medium to solve the problems of accessibility of higher education when it comes to social issues and working hours etc in addition to increasing the learning efficiency and it is estimated that by 2030 global higher education sector will observe around more than 400 billion enrollments which will be an increase of around more than 300% from the worldwide enrollment in in the year 2000 and by the year 2035 student enrollment in higher education worldwide on a global scale is expected to exceed 520 million in numbers so now you can see that uh, what a large scale these things they are uh, we have to manage them and this helps in academic mobility there have been uh, reports that more south asian students are choosing china for a higher education for example in case of students from myanmar opting for china reasons were the joint venture between those two countries and more job or job opportunities due to experience in china when they get back home and higher this highest number of students studying at higher education institutions in uh, say when we if we see the uh, chinese uh, experience they came from asian countries followed by the south koreans and uh, uh, similarly that uh, qs digital marketing uh, agency in the asian perspective in addition to china and india other countries like vietnam indonesia nepal and bangladesh they are also reporting improved economic development and therefore there are big chances that they would be also some of the prime recruitment zones within the next few decades and if if we take the case of vietnam its economy is steadily growing and thus people are able to afford better and overseas education and out of around 1.2 million international students enrolled in uh, bachelor's master's or doctoral programs in united states of america 77% are from asia so there has been an increase of around 13% in the number of active international students uh, uh, over a period of time in and if you see from south east asia students from vietnam to united states have increased uh, around 20% and the reason for this increase in student mobility they are various like the robust economic growth increase in ultra uh, you know uh, we call it as uh, h n i high net individual Th- those people getting you know uh, they are richer than others in terms of monetary value uh, like that and uh, uh, liking towards branded goods merchandise and over the living cost uh, you know uh, these things they become affordable by the people so they are uh, that uh, goes with uh, into that so if you see these things Uh, these are some of the uh, you know statistics i have taken from the uh, very latest reports that uh, you see the this is the times uh, uh, higher education ranking uh, which has declared that the university of oxford, uh, oxford uh, it is number 1 in the ranking uh, in there and uh, you see uh, there are around more than 20000 uh, total students and the number of stars and international students comprises around 42% and if you see all these universities uh, the uh, cit california institute caltech uh, 
they are 34 percent of the students they are international students harvard university has 24 uh, percent of international students uh, into it uh, like that so there is that what are the reasons for it number one means there may be the choice of subjects available to them the kind of other things if you see it in indian context uh, the leading public universities uh, although this is from statista the latest report but the data pertains to little a few years ago uh, by the international number of students uh, the university of pune rajiv gandhi university of health sciences osmania university then masur andhra aligarh muslim university then uh, maharashtra university of health sciences punjab etc so you see the international students they are preferring india as the destination for that and even if you see the international uh, uh, participation uh, uh, just uh, two years ago australia had the greatest number of international students compared to their higher education population with 31 percent students being the international one uh, second place was occupied by canada followed by the united kingdom that way you can see that and you may be knowing that many of these students from india they for them also Australia becomes a preferred destination from there. Some of the reasons to be is that if they when they ask them that what are the most popular fields of study for the international higher education students, and many of them who go for even for Australia, they also report that the business and management are the most common study subjects for international students. In when when the entry was held. So from uh, New Zealand, Australia, Poland, Japan, etc. Et you know, even from India, many students they go abroad for studying business or management courses. In spite of we having the IIMs, which are the world-rated institutions uh, there. And by comparison, engineering was the most popular field in say like US, Russia, Germany, and something those things from there. This is quite interesting. I will show it to you as a live website also. The global flow of tertiary level students. How means the, the, the movement is happening. And it, this is the case in India that uh, uh, the incoming students to India, they are from Nepal. Maybe the rupee is the same currency. So that may be adding to their easy and it is just our neighborhood country the Hindu, Hindu state, uh, 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 the uh, popular. So maybe people feel it easy to come uh, there. Then followed by Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, United States, Nigeria, Yemen, Malaysia, UAE. And it's a long list. It's only a screenshot. And then destination country means the Indian students going to these popular countries, Australia, or the top ranking. Then you have Canada, UK, Germany, Ukraine, New Zealand, Russian Federation, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, something, something, etc. So these things they are they they become quite interesting in this. And this is uh, uh, I'll finish the presentation and then maybe we can come back. It is a live website where you can just uh, you know take your arrowhead or it is on UNESCO UIS uh, uh, that this website and uh, say if you uh, go it I hope that this website will open soon and it will take you okay this is here just a moment let me so aerosize okay this image is loading this is live website yeah okay here it is showing you at present canada then how you know we, these arrowheads, they are showing that how the people are moving out. 6,000 students from Canada studied in UK. And then you see here, if you say go over India, so now this is India. And if you see the arrow here, many of them, they are moving to, going to 74,000 students from India studied in Canada in the, just few years ago. And uh, definitely after that, you know, we were forced for lockdown due to pandemic. And then a large number of 84,000 students from India studied in Australia, 
then you have other countries more or less you know people traveling to uh, uh, students in china going to russia 12000 and we, in our neighborhood you remember that uzbekistan ukraine and like that those things here so this is quite interesting if you want to uh, make some research in this field then this is here you can see all those uh, things which uh, are uh, you know quite interesting uh, going with that so that is there and then so this is a study uh, by uh, roga lipina and mursep they found what are the regions they they did an analysis of the choice of foreign students uh, for higher education institutions what are the factors and they found that you can say means quite interesting uh, number of factors they have been found uh and they made a, a quite an interesting list of the factors that why the people they they choose uh, important aspects so it can be the tuition fee the scholarship available the culture of the organization location of the country logistics <coughs> family friends suggestions sometime you know family tell that oh, okay go oh, there international academic quality focus on student something those are the factors uh, where which affect these things and then these are the top countries uh, uh, which are uh, preferred uh, you know uh, the people they come to india so you as you see nepal bhutan sri lanka afghanistan nigeria iran uh, bangladesh united states etc etc like there and why the people they try to have the internationalization the internet mobility is that sense of identity personally independent these are the these are the skills if you have them this mobility may be helpful to you to a very large extent so you should have mediation skills conflict resolution sensitivity humility fluency language fluency competence be able to better to speak if you are going to united states you need to speak uh, 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 english if you are going to germany you need to speak german if you are going to brazil you need to speak portuguese like that self awareness self confidence present yourself organizational skills so these are these are some of the things which help us to a great extent uh, for uh, there and then uh, the uh, uh, here are some interesting thing uh, and particularly in the context of if you say uh, when we discuss the major changes which have been proposed by the uh, national education policy 2020 and some of the uh, proposed uh, suggestions they have been that india to be promoted as a foreign study destination and every institution will have an international students office to host the foreign students colleges will be promoted to provide premium education at affordable costs another recommendation is that the foreign colleges can set up colleges in india top 100 foreign colleges will be allowed to set up their campuses in india as per the national education policy and they will be given special dispensation and regulations to set up their campuses and then by 2030 one large multidisciplinary college in every district that is the plan all higher education institutions will become multidisciplinary institutions and each of them will at least have an enrollment of around 300 students and by that time means say somewhere it is around 8 years uh, left now at least uh, uh, one large multidisciplinary higher education institution in or every uh, near every district and the aim is to increase the ger what is uh, that is the gross enrollment ratio in higher education which is currently around uh, say uh, means uh, uh, 28 30% up to 50% by 2035 and then uh, it is proposed that music arts literature to be taught in all colleges departments in language literature music philosophy indology uh, the uh, indian knowledge systems art dance theater education mathematics statistics pure science applied science sociology economics sports translation 
uh, interpretation, etc., they will be introduced in all higher education institutions. Then single common entrance examination for all colleges. And the policy suggests that there will be a single common entrance examination for admission to all higher education institutions, which will be held by, and you already know CUET. In some of these states, uh, you know, there have been certain concerns related to that. Since it is the first time, there were some problems faced by students. And I still remember that there have been, there have been some news about uh, some of the uh, news from Kerala on how the students, they have faced difficulty uh, when they went reached their examination center for that. So th these are the challenges which are you know, uh, coming up uh, because it's a new thing. And uh, we believe that very quickly, the planners uh, and the administrators, they will short these things out. And then the expenditure on education. It will be changed from 6% of the total GDP uh, as opposed to earlier, which was 4% of the uh, GDP. And both the state as well as the state government, uh, uh, they will be working together uh, on this uh, expenditure thing. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is uh, what I wanted to share uh, with all of you. And uh, if you want to go with that uh, uh, website to see, this is quite interesting of the UNESCO, the uh, international mobility of the students, then you can uh, you know, uh, visit that website. Okay, Dr. Sony, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, the, the participants can post their queries in the chat box. Yeah, I, I read it. There is one question by Raju. Is it not the USA to where Indian students are going in largest number? No, there, there is a difference between going to the maximum number or there. There are certain destinations where large number are going, but the largest, it's the statistics is telling you about this. So it's, it's not uh, necessary that uh, US is the only destination, but it depends on the uh, the subject as well. Like if you know that more than 20,000 students, they were studying medical sciences in uh, Ukraine, then they had to come back. And then there are other countries in which, so it depends on what kind of facility. And then the, the regulations, of the country, the kind of challenges they make, uh, that is a important factor for the uh, students to uh, select where they are going. Okay. That is the data says. It is not what I see. These are the figures, which are which are which are uh, taken from the you know uh, ministries' websites and other things. So there can be certain revelations about what we think and what what actually happens. And if you see that website, according to that, the number of students going to US were around 74,000, but number of students going to Australia were 84,000. So that way. No, US was there. If you say go to that website, many students, they go to US. In fact, we go to all the countries. It's not only that we are focusing only on uh, developed countries. Students, wherever they get the chance uh, to study, to take admission, because in our own country also, sometimes we find it difficult to get admission there. So in that case, students don't want to lose. Uh, and uh, I can see now uh, uh, Father Roy Abraham as well. So my namaste to him. What are the cultural and health complications of students going out and coming in? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, about the cultural, about the health implications, I think that uh, that goes with the regulations. There are certain things uh, that uh, the immigration will check 
and particularly in their own health interest as well you know if they have certain and if you remember that nowadays for complete uh, uh, especially for uh, uh, united states you can't take simple medicines unless you have the prescription uh, some people they have been returned back uh, because they 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 forgot to take the prescription and on the on the immigration counter when they landed there they were discussing that these are the common routine medicines they said that no 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 the rules are there like that so some of the countries and particularly like if you go to uh, new zealand or fiji no e table is allowed means you can't take even your uh, banana or apple or something that when you feel hungry you can eat it there seeds are not allowed because they can bring uh, disease they can bring another variety uh, which can destroy their crops or something that can happen like that so uh, that is uh, quite in, uh, important thing and for that it is always a good idea those students who are going out because coming in uh, there are uh, already things in place and those people they will take it so if you are going out it is better to check the regulations what they say about it about culture uh, definitely the most simple thing is that be respectful to all don't be the uh, because that is very much and you may be reading into the uh, media about the kind of uh, you can say it as uh, racism but uh, don't you think that uh, in india there is no racism here also we have the cases of racism when we name the uh, people uh, by their state that oh he is coming from that particular state or uh, on the basis of the color something so that is there means it is every society uh, something there and the, the 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 best thing is that to stay neutral not to uh, be uh, you know biased toward anyone follow the local rules that is the ground do as romans do while in home something what facilities should be provided to make our institutions on par with global standards yeah dr matthew that's a uh, important thing to, to come up to the global standards uh, we need to focus on certain things like the research profile of the institution the kind of facilities which are given the kind of freedom which is given for uh, uh, choice of courses for the identification of the research something and particularly the kind of ambience which is created there these things because when you uh, when anything this the qs ranking or other kind of rankings when we work on them then there are many things which are considered how respect we have for a particular culture for international that will be the a prime factor for that what kind of facilities uh, 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 focus on health and hygiene the uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, teaching and learning resources provided to them those things they matter those things they matter so we okay. have a question from here other than no, uh, other than the study in india program um, do we have any other options to attract the foreign students to india yeah there are various schemes and like nowadays uh, like uh, aicte is promoting that student exchange so sometimes those kind of things they can also be promoted Uh, uh, and some sort of uh, like there is a UGC scheme of GIAN, G I A N, which is the Global Initiative Network for Academics, and something. So those kind of things as a collaborative measure, and particularly with the help of online technologies, these things become easier. So in that case, the collaborations can be tied up, and then those uh, facilities they can be shared so that uh, the uh, students from india can go out outsiders can be brought to uh, india those 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 measures can be taken
Sir, uh, do you have any other suggestions to increase the number of foreign students? Uh, foreign Hello. students to India? <laughs> yeah, the the, 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 the uh, suggestion or the, uh, the mool mantra or the principle is simple. The image, the brand image. If our image is good, automatically people will come. If the image is bad, I remember that some years ago, I am a visiting professor in a university in Brazil. And when I had gone there, it was somewhere around uh, uh, 2016. And at that time in New Delhi, there was a that Nirbhya Kant and the whole of the country was feeling ashamed about that, which happened in New Delhi. And you know, I was in Malaysia at that time. I was not, te not teaching in India, but I'm in Indian. So from Malaysia, I had gone to Brazil for a keynote speaker. And there, there was this lady. She is a very senior professor from uh, a university in Canada. And she made me left, right. Your country is very bad and we will never visit to your country. And we women are not safe. And I, I had literally means a very tough time in convincing to her that we are also feeling ashamed about what has happened. It should not have happened, but believe you me that India is not a dangerous country. It is not a bad country. It is very safe. People come here, they stay here. Many foreigners, they make India as their home. They stay, they don't go back like that. But you know, some instances, they, 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 they kill the image. So image, the brand building, I think that is the top thing. If, if that is there, uh, the, the other thing they fall in place. So we need to do something about that. Many of our colleges do not promote practical experience on various theories taught in class. What can be done for this? Whereas colleges have brought emphasis on practice. Yes, Reshmi, Alex, this is a, a good suggestion. In fact, uh, it is something like of a uh, kind of instructional strategies which are adopted by the uh, institutions. But believe you me that nowadays, due to the internet, we should not be dependent on institution or teachers. It is the era, it is the time of self-directed learning. We need to become self-learner. There are two things we we all, when we when I say we, I include the teachers as well as student community both into that. There are two immediate needs to do. One, we need to become a faster learner because things are changing so fast, so quickly. Every day new thing is coming up. Just only yesterday night, my DAL, D-A-L-L dot A, DAL A, which is the open AI automatic artificial intelligence based software. If you do not know about it, I think uh, if I can show it to you uh, on my another laptop, this is the screen open. I have been granted permission to use Dell E, which is a artificial intelligence software to draw images. I will just tell the software some words and it will make a image, a photo for me. It is D-A-L-L dot E. That's a, an interesting AI package. They are allowing it uh, in a limited number to the people. So my turn came last night and I'm very happy. I posted it on my LinkedIn and on my uh, on Facebook. So things are changing very rapidly. Nowadays, there is that uh, a GPT-3 and a GPT-4, the general purpose pre-transformative transformer. You don't write code nowadays. You tell the software, I want a mobile app of this, 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 and it will create for you. So the content is, AI generated, we call it as uh, AI based UGC. UGC stands for not University Grants Commission. It stands for user generated content. So when these things are there, I believe that you we need to become faster learner, learn the things. And then second, a better learner. So self learning is very much important in that. There are tools available, there are resources available. Don't depend on your college for that. The scheme contributed will drive away the accessibility of ordinary students. Uh, uh, access, 
okay accessibility and inclusivity they are a, a big challenge and unfortunately not much work has been done towards that and it is the a, a time that uh, we need to be more serious about it although things are being done where study in india program we will have to submit some fee is there any direct method to attract foreign students to our institutions uh dr korean there are when it comes to the international things i think the mea the ministry of external affairs and other things the regulations uh, are there because it if it involves uh, yeah. although the government has uh, means what thinking of fdi in education and other things seems they are also being discussed and thought about but but you know interestingly some of the institutions uh, when they thought of going with the cryptocurrency also as the fee something but then the regulations uh, they are there so those things unless they are shorted out uh, means uh, there is no other direct method you can't sir there is a okay, question from the q and a box <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I have already uh, replied to that about cultural exchange and student exchange. Uh, it's through a uh, collaboration, some sort of MOU. And if you remember that very recently, the government, the UGC, has allowed that the uh, the, uh, the dual degree, the winning or the collaboration degrees with the foreign institutions that can be set up. So under that means th th that plan that those things they can be carried out. so that will be a good thing and the the uh, that uh, uh, guidelines are available on ugc website so those can be accessed from there in many universities the syllabus is targeting for securing marks that is very uh, unfortunate uh, uh, dr tommy in fact i laugh at it you know why cuet was introduced people were saying that uh, marks are compelling the students and parents lot of pressure there are some cases of suicide etc so cuet will erase all these things and very funnily if you see social media very recently this class 10th and 12th etc cbse result i have been declared i have not seen any uh, means message on facebook of uh, people oh my son has got 97% my daughter has secured 98% people themselves are highlighting the marks of their wards that is funny so why are you promoting again the same thing which we criticized some time ago that these are marks driven and due to that uh, i means ill of that system we wanted the, 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 the thought was there that oh, okay then bring the common entrance test so the marks of your 10th or 12th will not be the base but then the people themselves that project it so it fails the system Uh, i i really found it very funny and the, i i don't know if some one of you has also done that or not and that my 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 this my that has got 98% 95% why are you I, why can't you just say that oh i'm happy that my my son or my daughter has passed 12th class simply it's all pass even if you get uh, 150% of the marks not only 98% of the marks that way. change of mindset dr pami i think it it's part there but then so otherwise it, it is not going to work i agree with you that uh, but you know this, this is another interesting thing world economic forum oecd nep you talk to any organization in the name of scale in india we have so many things uh, uh, yes uh, dr korean says mindset is to be changed so many things we all talk about skill 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 so many offices new positions have been created uh, in the name of skill but does anybody know that how to uh, you know deal with that we talk about creativity skill communication skill this that etc etc but then educational institutions how are we dealing with that how are we giving the in terms of research for phd student you talk to any phd student there is a university i am in new delhi there is a university in haryana which is around 100 kilometers from the place where i am sitting there is a professor there the professor wants his phd student to come to me to 
to show the review of related literature to me, where I'm I'm not attached with the with that university or with that research scholar. Simply they are requesting me. I told I told them that okay, ask the person to send it by email to me. No, no, sir, the student will come to you. And I got angry. You are making one student to travel all the way from that state to New Delhi just to show me his papers. So these things they matter. The kind of skills we we never tell our students about the research skills. We don't tell. I uh, sometimes ago I gave a presentation on IPR and copyright things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There and that's why the plagiarism and other things, the academic dishonesty, it comes into the our system. But how does they come? Because we never teach our students how to cite properly, how to uh, uh, give respect to the academic uh, ownership of the content owned by someone else, those things. And that's why if these things happen, they also, that's why the research potential is low. So the foreign students, they won't come to do research in here, unless, unless it is like IITs, which have a good name, IIMs, or those things, or other colleges, which really have done good work in maintaining their image, in maintaining, maintaining their uh, uh, reputation. That is important. Can the students encourage to take up MOOC offered by you know, outside India? Yes, why not? Manjusha, uh, there are, I know there are many universities, there is students, even the vice chancellor, they tell their students that if you do this course from course here or something, we will accept it and the credit transfers will be there. So, that, uh, about it, no sure. It depends on the institution, however, how they treat it. But some of my known vice chancellors, I know them, that they, they themselves tell, and we recognize this course from Sira or Udemy or uh, including Khan Academy, something like that. They themselves promote it. And not only that, this is a good question, Manjusha. I will tell you one thing. There is a, let me type it into the chat box. It is called as, Open Educational Resource University, OERU. You make a Google search on OERU, Open Educational Resource University. There are many universities. They have come together, offer their courses, etc., free of cost. And then you can, and they have, means it is, it doesn't, it is not a physical university at all. It is just a group of universities. And in that, if you go to the website of OERU.org, you'll find that many universities which are quite prestigious like Oxford, et cetera. They are the member of that network. And one student has already been graduated from there. Took some courses from this, some courses from that, some courses from that, and then combined, and then the, 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 the degree was granted. So that thing is happening. This is a trend. And micro-credentials are increasing. That's why micro-credentials are short-term serious things. Your university, your office won't allow you to go only for one year or two years, or even for that matter, for six months. But definitely for three days, you can get the leave. Go for a quick tool or something, or uh, uh, micro-credentials for specialized kind of training. And then display it on your uh, social media profile to get more visibility for that. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for that very comprehensive talk and your responses. And we know that in the uh, context of the NEP 2020, uh, where we envision to attain global standards in higher education, your talk has uh, proven to be very relevant. Thank you so much again, sir. Uh, let me now welcome Dr. Anjali Joseph, Assistant Professor, Department of Hindi, Nirmala College, Mwatura, for the word of thanks. Thank you, dear Miss. A very good afternoon to all. Honorable Speaker of the session, Dr. R.C. Sharma, Director, Human Resource Development Center and Faculty for Inter Instructional Design and Chairperson, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar University, Delhi and other dignitaries and dear participants. It's my proud privilege to propose vote of thanks on this occasion for this such a great informative talk on internationalization of education delivered by none other than the most renewed personality in the academic sphere, Dr. R.C. Sharma. As we know, 
internationalization of education is a response to globalization in order to raise the quality of education to catch up to the global standards sir the session was highly informative and has given more insights into the strategies to cater the needs of the global knowledge society the way you looked into the topic and explored its possibilities have helped us to gain perspectives on this dynamic field of education sir we are truly honored by your insightful talk and on the behalf of the entire team and the participants we express our sincere gratitude for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion thank you sir thank you i would thank also so like much. to thank all the participants who are with us once again i thank you all for your valuable presence thank you thank you Bye dr everyone. anjali take care yeah so, you, sir, sir um, <coughs> father father roy has joined the program <laughs> oh yes 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 that's great i just want to say one thing that uh, i have worked in, i have taught in taiwan in brazil in fiji in malaysia uh, and uh, i have visited some uh, african countries also believe you me when you go out when we then see other culture our mental horizon it definitely expands we learn new things we develop a new kind of attitude towards life towards ourselves and towards others and most of the time it results for the betterment of every one of us so if you get the opportunity try explore and go out okay so thank you so much with these words uh, my namaste to everyone thank you sir with that we are moving on to the panel discussion the discussion will be on the topic implementation of outcome based education in higher education institutions let me call upon dr soni kuriyakus iqac coordinator of the college to introduce and to moderate the a uh, panel discussion over to you sir so dear participants now we have reached uh, at the most important uh, part of this conference and it's a panel discussion on implementation of outcome based education in higher education institutions so the our panelists are reverend dr roy abraham p he is the director of uh, saver institute of management and entrepreneurship Dr. Binu Mathieu, he is the IQAC Director of uh, Marian College, Autonomous College, uh, Kutikanam, Kerala. And uh, Dr. Rupa Lee, uh, he, she is the Head of the Department of Commerce at uh, Central Oceans Autonomous College, Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. We all know that um, after signing the Washington Accord, the government of india and uh, ugc nac all these higher education agencies insist the higher education institutions to implement outcome based curriculum framework but majority of the institutions came to know about the outcome based education only after its inclusion in the nac manual in the 2017 so it has changed the scenario in a significant way so after that many institutions higher education institutions nac uh, in the case of kerala kerala higher education council uh, they have organized the n number of workshops related to the concept of uh, obe how to implement obe in higher education institutions how to write program outcomes how to write course outcomes how to measure Uh, the outcome i mean the attainment of outcome so there there were many workshops during the last 7 uh, years uh, mm -hmm. but at the grassroots level still the higher education institutions are facing problem while implementing the outcome based education we know that n number of softwares are available but many of the uh, teachers do not know the philosophy or logic behind the calculation of attainment so that is why we have included a session on this particular aspect and uh, we got 
eminent personalities for this uh, panel discussion. I would like to uh, mention uh, the, the procedure. Um, each speaker will be getting 30 minutes and then after 30 minutes uh, you can you can post your queries in the chat box so they will they'll be answering uh, your queries our first speaker uh, is uh, reverend dr roy abraham p he is currently the director of uh, saver institute of management and entrepreneurship bangalore uh, many of us know his credentials. He was the former principal of Marian College, Kutikanam. Marian College, Kutikanam is the youngest autonomous college in India. Um, Father Roy uh, is a NAC PT member. He has done his MS from uh, United States and uh, he, he has done his studies at uh, Loyola College, Chennai. So during his uh, period at uh, Marian College, Kutikanam, he has totally restructured uh, the teaching, learning and evaluation process at uh, Marian College. For that, they got the appreciation uh, from the Vice President of India, Honorable Vice, Vice President uh, Sri Vengaya Naidu. And uh, <coughs> yeah, many of us know that Marian College, Kutikanam is the pioneers um, uh, one of the pioneers who have Im implemented outcome-based education in, in an effective way. Um, and uh, another very important contribution uh, of Father Roy is that before uh, the implementation of Christian Bank in Mahalma Gandhi University, uh, I think Marian College Kutikanam is the first college that implemented the Christian Bank system uh, in Kerala. With immense pleasure, I, I would like to invite uh, f f Father Dr. Roy Abraham to deliver his address. Father. Father, kindly unmute your mic. Father, your presentation is visible. Kindly unmute your mic. And
dear participants we are sorry for the inconvenience kindly uh, wait while we rectify the problem thank you So there was a, a technical delay. Uh, Father will join, uh, join very soon. So uh, for the time being, our second speaker, speaker Dr. Binu Matthew, um, will address us. He's the IQAC director of uh, Marian College, Kutikanam. Uh, his specialization is uh, OBE implementation in higher education institution. Uh, he has coordinated the Paramarsha scheme of UGC of uh, uh, Marian College, Kutikanam. And uh, Marian College has become the first institution in India to successfully guide a mentee institution uh, towards uh, successful accreditation. Um, and he has uh, written three books on uh, outcome-based uh, um, uh, outcome based education implementation. And uh, he has established a center for teaching, uh, learning and evaluation at uh, uh, Marian College, Kutiganam. And uh, during very, uh, within a very short span of time, he has raised a lot of income, I mean consultancy income by implementing uh, outcome-based education in many higher education institutions across the country. And with, with uh, much pleasure, I invite Dr. Binu Matthew to deliver his address. Welcome, Binu, sir. Uh, sir, please yes, unmute your mic. Thank you. Thank you, Sony, sir. For, uh, uh, yes, yes. You are audible. You are audible. So, yeah. thank you. And uh, uh, congratulations from our side for conducting such a program, especially with the support of NAC. So, Father Roy, uh, who was uh, with us as a principal and recently has joined the XIME Bangalore, and he will be joining because of some technical uh, difficulties. Uh, I thought I will be uh, starting the session. So uh, we will start the session and meanwhile, Father Roy will be joining. So I'll be talking on uh, the, the basic overview of outcome-based education and its framework. And to begin with, why do we need a, a change? Uh, or why, why do we have to think about uh, implementing outcome-based education? And just to remind you about the need for a change in education, if we just go through the changes we have witnessed maybe uh, over the past 100 years. We have seen drastic changes happening in communication from all the telephone systems to ultra modern uh, smartphones, which we are using. And we can say all the technologies which we might have experienced in our life, maybe for the past 50 years, now it is being converged into a small device called smartphones. So a lot of uh, changes are happening in 
uh, telecommunication sector. In home entertainment, we, we can see uh, the changes happening. But uh, when we come to the classroom teaching, uh, any changes happening in classroom teaching, if you take the uh, classrooms, maybe 100 years old, or this is supposed to be a classroom in BC, uh, 2000 years old, or 100 years old, or if you go for a classroom just before COVID, it is almost remaining the same. But our students, they were born into technology. We call it as millennium generation students. And uh, now because of the COVID, now again, we were promoting a lot of technology. And our students, they are eagerly waiting for a change in teaching learning environment. So when we stick on to our old uh, conventional lecturing method and the syllabus covering, as far as we our teachers are concerned, we say we are covering the syllabus, the similar the covering the syllabus. We need to think about what our students are learning and what they will be able to do because they prefer a lot of experiential learning. And when we think about what the students will be able to do at the end of a program, we are moving towards the outcome-based education. So the competency-based education, that is the starting point. So the competency-based education is defined as the approach, allows the students to advance based on their ability to master the skills or competency at their own pace. So when we think about the skill or competency developed by the students, so we need to change our focus from syllabus coverage or from teaching to what kind of skills, abilities, knowledge the students will be developing. And when we are moving towards the student-oriented approach of developing skills in students, we say we will be moving towards outcome-based education. So outcome-based education is a process that involves the assessment and evaluation of practices that reflect the attainment of expected skills by students. So uh, instead of asking what syllabus we covered, what we taught in the class, and how much the students were able to remember uh, what we were teaching, when we move to the outcome-based education, it is the assessment of the attainment of certain expected learning. So that is the starting point in outcome-based education. So the, the problems of the conventional teaching learning method is we give a lot of emphasis on grades. What is the grade and how much percentage the students are getting? And we are not bothering about after getting all these percentages and grades, what the students will be able to do. We are not focusing on this. And because of this grades and the, the <clears throat> uh, more emphasis on grades, we see a lot of malpractices during our assessment processes. And higher education, we may be experiencing the lack of enthusiasm from the student's point of view because they don't have much thing to do in our classrooms. So uh, we need to uh, think about how we can develop a student-oriented, outcome-oriented, experiential-based learning where we can create an enthusiasm about among the students regarding learning and we can provide them an engaging really interesting and engaging learning environment. But truly speaking, uh, we are all, especially the education institutions, we are thinking about the OBE and OBE framework because now the NAC accreditation, the NAC is asking for this. So I would also like to give some emphasis on what NAC is expecting and uh, what kind of but answers we need to provide to NAC. So the first, if we are going for NAC accreditation as an autonomous institution, the first question itself is, 
the curricula developed and implemented have relevance to the local national regional and global development needs which is reflected in the program outcomes program specific outcomes and course outcomes of the uh, programs offered by the institution so the the nac itself is uh, the first question itself in uh, autonomous institutions it is about outcome based education and we need to tell how our program outcomes program specific outcomes and course outcomes are reflecting the local needs national needs regional needs and global development needs and for answering this we must be having a clear idea about uh, what uh, what is meant by program outcomes program specific outcomes and course outcomes and again when we come to the uh, the other criteria of nac in criterion 2 2.6.1 but in the latest manual uh, you may be seeing that these two questions are merged and the weightage has been increased drastically now it is a 45 uh, weightage question and uh, you need to describe how you have developed your course outcomes program outcomes and program specific outcomes how it is being uh, uh, circulated or how it is being communicated to your students and you are how you are evaluating this the entire process you have to uh, narrate and it has to be explained to the peer team and these are the two questions available in the revised nac accreditation framework regarding uh, outcome based education and when we think about the outcome based education the major components we have the learning objectives and learning outcomes and learning indicators and the differentiation between objectives and outcomes it is a bit confusing uh, among higher education institutions and whether the objectives and outcomes are same or not so i will be explaining this in my subsequent presentation so objective means the objective set by the teacher what we are planning to teach and outcomes means if the teacher is meeting the objectives then once the teacher meets the objectives what outcomes what um, skills and abilities will be demonstrated by the students it indicates the learning outcomes and learning indicators means once they demonstrate the outcomes what the teacher will be able to assess so it may be an assignment it may be a program or it may be a chart prepared by the student all this which is used for uh, indicating the attainment of outcomes this is called the learning indicators and we need to derive the outcomes in such a way that these outcomes which we derive this has to be measurable and we must be able to evaluate this and uh, the the people this should be observable so whether the students have achieved this outcome or not uh, it has to be made observable so either if i go through the characteristics of obe curricula we have program educational objectives we start from with the program educational objectives this is called peo and we have program outcomes course learning outcomes and performance indicators and this is outcome driven this entire curricula is outcome driven and we are assessing the attainment of outcomes and it is centered around students and students are our stakeholders what skills and abilities the students are attaining we are sent, we are moving around it is a student centric uh, way of teaching <clears throat> and when we come to the program educational objectives that is starting point of obe framework so this is actually the skills abilities and certain characters we are expecting our students when they are away from our campus that means after graduation after 3 to 5 years of graduation when they are working in the society what kind of skills <clears throat> what characters what attitudes we are expecting from our students once we derive this, once we systematically categorize this once we narrate this this is called program educational objectives 
then program outcomes means irrespective of the programs irrespective of the discipline of an institution an institution may be inculcating certain values skills and abilities uh, to our students and at the time of graduation when they are about to leave the institution what kind of skills what kind of attitudes what kind of abilities we are inculcating on our students and what skills they have at the time of graduation if we define this this is called the program outcomes and program specific outcomes means uh, when you have a specific program like bsc computer science or bsc mathematics or msc physics or mca what <clears throat> qualities what abilities what skills uh, will be inculcated in your students by completing this specific program so if you want to differentiate between two programs uh, you can differentiate the programs just by defining clear cut cut program specific outcomes for the uh, program <clears throat> then uh, this is this outcome based education uh, framework is quite logical and it defines a lot of unsolved mysteries in education institution because when we think about the vision and mission of an institution irrespective of all the irrespective of uh, the branches or discipline all the education institutions will be having very fascinating vision and mission statements and as far as education institutions are concerned we exist we strive uh, for the attainment of our vision and mission we are teaching our students we conduct a lot of activities and uh, we uh, exist for the purpose of attaining the vision and mission so that is the purpose of defining vision and mission but in the case of an education institution whether it is marian college puttikanam or your institution or nirmala college matuvira as far as an education institution is concerned we can do only one business or we can do only one activity we can teach our students <clears throat> so this outcome based education uh, clearly narrates the way which we should proceed so that uh, we will be able to attain the vision and mission of the institution we will be able to attain or we will be able to establish the purpose of existence of our uh, institution so our founders might have started our institution with a purpose and that purpose is defined clearly defined uh, as the mission and mission statement and the outcome based education also we start from this vision and mission and <clears throat> how we can attain the mission and mission any education institution we teach our student the only thing we can do as an education institution is we can teach our students and by teaching the students we need to attain the mission and vision so education institutions can attain the mission and vision through the students in such a way that we uh, create graduates or we teach students they become graduates and they move to the society they serve for the society for the rest of your life their life and when they serve for the society through their attitudes through certain skills and abilities they might have developed when they studied in our institution or uh, through certain values we have inculcated on them when they were our students they will be working in the society and when they serve the society through their interventions in the society only we will be able to achieve our vision and mission so from the mission and vision we need to develop a set of uh, objectives that objectives are called program educational objectives these objectives has have to clearly say what our students will be demonstrating what our students will be doing what attitudes they will be possessing when they are away from the campus when they are after maybe four to five years of graduation when they are in the society what they will be doing and through their deeds only 
we will be able to achieve our vision and mission. So from your vision and mission, you need to derive a set of program educational objectives that will be telling what your students will be doing after four to five years of graduation when they are serving the society. And if we need to achieve this program educational objectives, you must be defining a set of program outcomes and program specific outcomes. Program outcomes are certain general qualities and skills, attitudes, abilities you are expecting your students to develop at the time of graduation when they are uh, about to leave your institution. And the program specific outcomes are certain skills and abilities you will be inculcating on your students as a part of completing a specific program. And with the skills and abilities, they will be uh, going to the society and they will start serving the society. And if you need to develop the program, certain program outcomes and program specific outcomes, you must be selecting certain courses uh, in your programs. And also you need to include certain course outcomes so that that through the attainment of this course outcomes, you the your students will be attaining program outcomes and program specific outcomes. And once this program outcomes and program specific outcomes are attained, they are moving to the society and they will be working for the society and uh, they will be attaining the program educational objectives of the institution. And if the program educational objectives of the institution is attained by our alumni, in turn, finally, our institution will be uh, attaining the uh, mission and vision. So this is this OB framework. <clears throat> this is the development phase. So from your mission and vision, you need to develop program educational objectives, program outcomes and program specific outcomes based on program outcomes and program specific outcomes, you need to level up the course outcomes. And in OB framework, we will be assessing only the course outcomes. So there are certain techniques, formulas, uh, the, the steps for evaluating the attainment of course outcomes. And once the course outcomes are attained, this is the attainment phase. If the course outcomes are properly attained, the students will be attaining the program outcomes and program specific outcomes. And if, the, if this is attained, then automatically program educational objectives will be attained. And if the institution is able to attain the educational objectives through the students, finally, the institution will be attaining the vision and mission. So this is the OB framework, which is being visualized and what we are trying to implement. Then <clears throat> this is what I was explaining, program educational objectives of us to achieve the mission and mission, program outcomes and program specific outcomes must address the program educational objectives. This is how sequentially it is derived. <coughs> and course outcomes must relate to the program outcomes and program specific outcomes. And <clears throat> uh, then finally, we need to include certain courses into your, uh, sorry, certain topics into your courses so that these courses, will, these topics will be leading to the course outcomes. So <clears throat> this vision and mission in our V framework is as if we are launching a satellite to the geostationary orbit. So once it is being launched to the geostationary orbit, it has to circulate there for a longer period and as if it is sending our students to society. But for sending our students to <coughs> the society, we need certain uh, rockets to be fired at different stages. So course outcomes will be in the initial stage and this will give the students the push, the sufficient push or sufficient thrust to reach at the level of program outcomes and program specific outcomes. And once they are in this level, this program outcomes and program specific outcomes will give them the additional thrust to reach at the level of program educational objectives. And once they are in the program educational objectives are achieved, this will uh, give them the, the thrust to circulate or to revolve around the society to attain the mission and vision of the institution. And this is what is being visualized 
in the object, the OB framework. So when we uh, come to the program outcomes, this is a bit confusing area because if it is an engineering uh, discipline, uh, AACT has defined the program outcomes for engineering discipline. But uh, as far as arts and science colleges are concerned, the program outcomes are not defined. It is uh, clearly stated in the NAC manual. So it is the responsibility of the, the institutions to devise the program outcomes and this program outcomes, but NAC manual says it is irrespective of the discipline. So <clears throat> uh, you need to devise a set of program outcomes and this program outcomes will tell uh, what skills, abilities, knowledge, attitudes will be developed on your students if they take a program at your institution. So this is not discipline specific. This, will, this is an institution specific. Uh, then uh, we have mission statements and just, I am, uh, just for getting an idea how the program outcomes can be derived from your mission and vision. So you please see the Marian mission, <coughs> sorry, Marian mission. We say, we commit ourselves to achieve our vision through endless pursuit of knowledge, fostering spiritual and human values, networking and collaborating for synergy, establishing campus community network, promoting sustainable living, ensuring a learning environment of creativity, adventure of ideas, constant innovation, enabling academic ambience, and state-of-the-art information and communication technology. And based on this, you can see <coughs> we have derived nine program outcomes. So we say, <clears throat> regardless of the program, irrespective of the discipline, once a student graduates from Marian College, at the time of graduation, the student will be showing these qualities or skills or attitude in their life. And with this, they will be moving to the society. And once they move to the society with these qualities and attitude, abilities, uh, Marian College will be attaining its vision and mission over a period of time. So this is the <clears throat> entire concept of OBE framework. And uh, somewhere in the beginning, I have mentioned, uh, once you derive your outcomes, this has to be uh, clear, it has to be uh, measurable, and it, it should be observable. And also I told you I'll be giving an idea about what is the difference between objectives and uh, the outcomes. So objectives means as far as a teacher or a resource person is concerned, what we are planning to teach, what we are planning to talk. And this is something has to be achieved by the resource person or the teacher and we need to meet or fulfill our objectives. So as far as I am concerned, this may be, this can be my objectives of spending uh, maybe one hour with you, introduce the OB framework, teach about the PO, PSO and CO concepts, then uh, introducing ICT enabled teaching learning tool, it is not my objectives now. Uh, my objectives for this is only to uh, introduce the OB framework and teach PO, PSO. So that is my objectives when I uh, start my session. And <clears throat> once I, I can derive or I can mention the outcomes of this, workshop can be like this. Upon completion of this workshop, the participants will have knowledge about OBE, understanding about POPSO, familiarity with OBE terminologies. But if I use these terms like knowledge, understanding, familiarity like this, this is very vague. Uh, nobody will be able to assess or measure or uh, whether you have this knowledge or understanding, or it will be very difficult for you to demonstrate this knowledge and understanding also. But if I change my outcomes like this, upon completion of this uh, maybe seminar, you will be able to describe various components of OB. You will be able to define PSO, PO, and COs in arts, humanities, and engineering. Enlist major components of OB. Develop your PSO, POs like this. So if I keep my outcomes like this, 
the difference is all these outcomes are measurable it will be very very easy to demonstrate these outcomes anybody will be able to measure whether you are demonstrating this so once you develop your outcomes in ob framework please ensure that you develop your outcomes like this so that you will be able to assess whether your students are demonstrating this most of the time uh, we uh, get lot of complaints from uh, teachers saying that it is very difficult to assess the outcomes and if you are able if you are have difficulties in assessing the outcomes it is not because of the assessment methods it is because of your outcomes once you set your outcomes please ensure that you are keeping outcomes which are measurable observable so with this so uh, i am expected to talk for around 30 minutes so i hope i have gave you a sufficient introduction about the ob framework so i thought of introducing this framework and in subsequent sessions uh, we will be having more discussion on this so uh, let me conclude my session now and uh, we will be continuing with the discussions and question and answer sessions thank you thank you uh, dr binu um participants can post your queries in the chat box so before that uh, i have a query uh, dr binu uh, so your specialization is uh, implementation of ob in higher education institutions so can you can you give a road map how an institutions can uh, implement it in an in, a, in an education institution something like a, a stage wise approach so can you can you uh, elaborate on that i mean on the implementation part so uh, if uh, we are going for implementation the first thing will be uh, making a change especially in teachers because and early a new uh, way of teaching new way of assessment and uh, new way of learning also so when we uh, uh, want to implement it for the first time in an education institution so we need to develop the confidence among the teachers and the teachers should be having a clear idea about uh, the advantage of this and how the students community is going to benefit out of this and once the student uh, once the teachers are ready for accepting a change uh, we can start developing our uh, program outcomes so uh, that is the starting point because usually in education institutions what we do is we will be having a ready syllabus and we are trying to find out the course outcomes of the syllabus and somewhere we are trying to fit this course outcomes into our program uh, already the syllabus will be there and for that syllabus we will be defining our program specific outcomes and we will be trying to fit out fit in uh, this uh, course outcomes into somewhere into that program specific outcomes that is what happening everywhere so once you are uh, mentally ready and prepared to implement uh, all the teaching community and students are ready to implement this you have to go the other way you need to decide on the program outcomes what should be the skills and abilities your students must be having and from there you have to come down it has to be a bottom down approach and if these are the your program outcomes then uh, if we want to attain this program outcomes what kind of program specific outcomes and course outcomes must be there then only you need to decide what kind of courses and what kind of topics you need to include in your curriculum and our ultimate aim should be the attainment of program outcomes and program specific outcomes uh, so that our implementation will be meaningful thank you dr binu i think now uh, reverend dr father roy ibrahim p is available with us uh, father kindly join us I am there. I think I am audible too. Yeah, yeah, father, father, you, you are audible. You are audible. Yes. Thank you. Can I begin my session, or how do you want it? 
yeah 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 yes uh, as i mentioned uh, in the beginning um, father roy ibrahim p uh, is the director at uh, saver institute of management and entrepreneurship uh, bangalore he was the former uh, principal of marian college kutikanam uh, you know that marian college kutikanam is the youngest uh, autonomous college uh, in india so during his period uh, the to- he as a father father roy has totally restructured the teaching learning and evaluation processes at the marian college and for that the marian college got appreciation from uh, government of india uh, the vice president of uh, um, india honorable um, venkaiya naidu sir has appreciated the efforts of uh, uh, marian college kutikanam and uh, <coughs> with the pleasure and gratitude i welcome uh, father roy to this program and just starting please okay okay father when one thing is is correct other thing is i don't know it is not able to share father uh, i'll i'll share from another computer i think there is some problem somewhere maybe with the network okay let me let me just uh, uh, begin um, thanking everybody or the organizers for organizing such a wonderful uh, program and i am very happy to listen to the presentation by um, dr binu thomas already um, and um, i think most of my duties are already over because he has uh, given enough input and then uh, my duty is made much simple um i am just trying to share my file now but there is some technology which is here and there <laughs> can you permit one more login for me sir sony sir yes yes, yes we can do uh, that we could can you that, uh, re- uh, remove my file share permission and uh, you can also remove my host permission so that uh, father may be getting the so kindly remove my file permission father kindly rejoin with the second account okay it is showing that um, father what is the name of this second account same name only same name same name going wrong uh, so, uh, father only one roy is there uh, i think it is another name
Am I coming there? Presentation is not coming. Um, Father, can you raise your hands? Uh, I mean, in the in the chat box, or is it coming? Uh, the PPT is not coming. Um, Last time, PPT so can you show your hand? I'm in the chat box. Raise, uh, raise option. Yeah, now I have raised. Uh, I mean, from the other computer. I mean, from the other computer. Other, other account which uh, father is from there I rise. Sorry, I'm really sorry. It never happened. So it is okay, father. Um, so, so with our presentation, uh, can we move? Uh, so I think the presentation is there on your screen. Yeah, without presentation, I can talk, but uh, I thought, yeah. uh, can I take two minutes? Yes, 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 yes. Not more than that, I can I can just start with our, if there are questions, I can just take that and then build on that. Yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah. Um, my point was, the, um, let me just begin without maybe the presentation. Um, See, the outcome-based education um, came into being um, in the in two prominent contexts. One, that is because of the high migration that was happening. When can, people started moving from one country to another, either for job or for higher studies, there needed a certain amount of parity between countries and understanding. See, now many of our students are going to Russia or to uh, different other countries for medical studies. And when they come back, if the medical profession required ethics, uh, the procedures and such other things are not matching with that of India, we may not be permitted to, we may not permit them to work in India. Same is the case with the, our medical professionals when they go to US, they are not supposed to uh, do the medical profession unless they go through some of the trainings there. Why? Because the expected behavior patterns, the expected procedure patterns are quite different from countries. And this situation arose between countries. And in 18... In 1989, in 1989, six countries in the world joined together and they made a an agreement between them that their engineering graduates will have the same set of skills between them so that they will be employable in any one of the countries. The six initial countries were um, US, of course, UK, Canada, Australia, and other countries. And then gradually this, this became, this agreement came to know as Washington Accord. And gradually, many countries started joining on onto the uh, joining the Washington Accord, the agreement between them. And India also became an, a signatory to Washington Accord in 2014 through National Board of Accreditation, which is the accrediting board under AACT, like that of NAC under UGC. So. NBA accrediting NBA signed Washington Accord for India. And from 2014, national body started emphasizing on outcome-based education. First of all, they concentrated in engineering graduates. So when engineering graduates started migrating from country to countries, if they have the same skill sets available, that made it helpful for the countries to either admit them for higher studies or admit them for jobs. And now with the NEP in place and NAC 
also coming into the outcome based education. UGC also got into outcome based education. Why? Because, of course, as we know, earlier mostly the professionals went for job outside. Now, irrespective of the nature of the uh, degree program, students or people started moving from country to countries for job or higher studies. And therefore, this outcome specification became a big necessity amidst higher educational institutions in order to give a parity. Suppose a commerce student goes moves from India to UK for higher studies. The expected skill sets, knowledge sets are not similar. He cannot be either employed or get into higher studies. Similarly, in any countries. And that gave way to a standardization of skill sets available out of a particular degree program. This was further triggered or fastened by the technological growth that came in through internet. See, internet actually gave a significant boost to knowledge seekers. If you wanted to know anything, unlike in the past, we neither have to go to the library nor have to approach any knowledgeable person. We can just go to our device and then Google it and find out the information. So with that, emphasis on knowledge became much less. Whereas emphasis on skill sets out of any particular program became much more important. Today, if I don't know the address of a, even a, an institution anywhere in the globe, I can just try to find out from Google what is the email address, what is the postal address, who are the people in place. So any information you want, you can definitely get with the assistance of technology. So this, together with the heavy migration from countries to countries, made it necessary for a certain amount of standardization for available skill sets out of a particular degree program. And therefore, the Washington Accord came, India became a signatory. Now UGC has insisted on coming out with outcome-based education. If you look at the recent publication on draft policy for um, higher education um, that is completely on outcome-based education. After the NEP, if you look at, I think at least three, four publications have were made by UGC. All of them were on outcome-based education. Now that was the situation uh, happening. And then uh, what is outcome-based education, how is it different from the past? See, earlier, the emphasis was more on knowledge, less on skill sets. Because knowledge was considered to be something very, very significant. And we need to know to act. Without knowledge to act, action was very difficult. Now, if you didn't know to uh, the address of a person, you couldn't write a letter or post it to him. Now, even if you don't know the uh, address, you can easily grab it from Google and write the letter uh, and post it now. So similarly with anything, if, if, if you know how to use the knowledge, you don't have to remember in your head. What you primarily require is the ability to use available knowledge either in your head or it is available from some source. So you can always take that knowledge and use it in, in your life. So that is the primary difference between the challenge of yesterday compared to that is of today. And that is why if you look at even government of India is speaking a lot about skilling India. 
there are special initiatives by government of india to skill our people and now coming to how this outcome based education and its history when you look at it. see actually outcome based education was started in a small way in africa in south africa actually whereas it was popularized and developed in us by and primarily by william spadi who was a school headmaster in us he his he authored a lot he experimented a lot in school education in outcome based education and through him outcome based education was made very prevalent in developed nations in the us and all it came in last century in by 1980s whereas in our country it is in the for i would say for the past 10 years now and again um, as earlier pointed out by dr binu thomas the emphasis is more on what a student will be able to do and it is no more about what he will be able to remember it is more about doing and it is no more about teaching it is more about assurance of learning so earlier it was enough that an extremely good teacher with high academic record is appointed and he goes and teaches and the teacher he was going to show the intellectual muscle through probably not referring to anything at hand will be able to explain a complete theory to the teacher or uh, sorry a complete theory to the students or might be able to uh, engage three hours consecutively without referring to any textbook or anything but now that is not the challenge now what is most important is to see that your students have mastered the skill sets required so it is more about learning assurance of learning and it is not about also using memory more it is about using the information from anywhere and applying it to a special context and again um its outcome based education is more result oriented and now it is more process oriented with outcome based education what is what has become more important is the teaching learning process so now we define course outcomes program outcomes program specific outcomes at three levels of course that is true however the process also is very very important now the process of skilling every student has become supremely important today and therefore it is not enough that i prepare my teaching materials from any particular source or most probably from a reference book i remember all that and go reproduce exactly the same without any mistake that's not enough we should also try to design appropriate tools so that students may be performing within the class and the teacher will be able to give them feedback so it is more about designing learning tools that a teacher should be quite innovative on information is already there now how will i make my students actually learn and they are here they are in any place is not to listen the intellectual muscle of the teacher is more about their learning and therefore it has what three process as soon as i if i am a teacher what should i do i should go and tell my students what skill sets you will be able to attain from my class what are the skill sets that will be 
that you will be able to use in your life sitting in my class. And then they should also be told, how can you achieve these skills? Maybe by watching some videos, they maybe by asking them to perform certain tasks in individually or in groups, unlike that. And they should also be uh, third time as the third point. They should also be clearly told how are they going to be assessed. So when all these processes are aligned, how are they going to be assessed? Okay, I am going to assess whether you have achieved the oratory skill from these rubrics. When those things are very clearly told to the student. Learning becomes very easy for them. They know how are they going to be evaluated. What should I do to enhance my skill sets in the area? And what am I finally supposed to do? All these things are very clear. And therefore, uh, learning becomes easier and fun. As is already told by Dr. Benio Thomas, there are three levels of outcomes. First level is course outcome. I think more or less program outcome and program specific outcomes were told by Dr. Benio. I am just concentrating only to course outcomes, which is actually fundamental to outcome-based education. See, course outcomes are those skills out of a particular subject which you take. Whereas program specific outcomes are the outcomes out of a particular degree program. Program outcomes are the outcomes of, I would say, Nirmala College. So all Nirmalites will be having these this qualities qualities with them when they graduate out. So that is the kind of level. So one is at the course level, the other is at the degree level, the third is at the institutional level. And when we speak about course outcomes, it is often said there should be outcomes be smart. What is meant by smart is used as an acronym. The outcome, first of all, shall be very specific. The Suppose I say, after the completion of uh, the, my, my uh, course, that the student will be able to explain a particular concept is very, very specific. Whereas, if I make too many wordy statements, then it becomes not specific and even neither the student nor the teacher will be able to explain clearly. Secondly, it shall be measurable. Measurability, suppose I say, see, if I have to measure something, none of us can measure the love. What can we measure? The expression of love we can measure. Similarly, if I say, after my class, the student will be quite knowledgeable about outcome-based education, then I cannot measure because knowledge is something internal. If I have to measure something, it has to be external. The love of our children, we measure through their presence, the way they talk, the way they gift uh, on important days, and like that. Similarly, we can measure knowledge only if it is expressed. And that is why in the early, Dr. Minu was pointing out that student will be able to explain or the student will be able to demonstrate. So such action verbs are very much necessary in framing outcome for a particular course. And also we should see that we, we should not set a, a, a course outcome that is not achievable. Our course outcomes shall be highly achievable. 
within the time frame available, maybe six months or three months, or depending on the time frame available for that particular course, we should fix up a, a target level of achievement of a particular skill. Father, uh, Father, can you finish it in five minutes? Yes, yes. Five, five minutes? Yes, yes, I can do that. So skill sets can be um, defined in such a way that it is achievable and realistic and time bound. And as far as possible, we are very clear about the Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy levels, as far as possible, try to create course outcomes at a higher level of Bloom's taxonomy to analyze, evaluate, and create, especially at a higher educational level. And as already mentioned, I'm, I'm completing this. Um, there could be um, also a direct and indirect method of assessing the attainment of the course outcomes. Direct methods are all methods by which we conduct exams, quizzes, assignments, seminars, all that. Indirect assessment is the self-assessment by the student. Both can be combined, but to initiate, it would be better that we uh, limit assessment of the outcome to direct assessment. And when it comes to PO, program outcome, as already mentioned, see NBA accreditation manual says that PO is, they are seeing it as <coughs> PSO in, in, B, in NAC. PO and PSO, there is a confusion. PO in NBA manual is equivalent to PSO in NAC manual. So there is a terminology conflict, but I think most of you are coming from arts and science colleges and therefore the confusion is not there. I'm thankful to uh, the organizers. I'm sorry for uh, not making it very clear to all of you. I'll send my PPT to the uh, organizers so that it may be made available to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Roy Ibrahim P. Uh, I think uh, there are no questions in the chat box. Um, sir, we have uh, one, more, one more session from Dr. Rupali Akhilwalia. Uh, she is the head of the Department of Commerce at uh, St. Aloysius Autonomous College, Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, she got postdoctoral fellowship of uh, ICSSR and she has done uh, her uh, doctoral studies uh, uh, on international trade relations. She is the academic council member of uh, St. Aloysius Autonomous College uh, and she was the gold medalist uh, during her studies. Uh, I understand from his from file, uh, she is a special uh, designing value-added course um, and she is an ex curriculum in the initiatives. Um, St. Aloysius College, uh, Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh uh, is a mentor college for nine mentee colleges and she has the track record of uh, implementing OBE in all these three and nine mentee colleges and uh, she will be talking implementation of OBE. Uh, Madam, please. Madam, your audio, uh, please, please unmute. Your your audio is not there. Uh, 
still still it is not coming uh, so you are visible video is okay audio Uh, madam can you can you disconnect and uh, reconnect the mic there, there is a technical issue uh, Uh, madam can you try without earphone uh, i think still there is an issue uh, Dr. Rupali will rejoin. Kindly bear with us. So, Nisa, meanwhile, we can uh, respond to some of the queries. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, sir, sir, I was uh, about to ask a question. So you said one of the major hurdle uh, is, I mean, changing the attitude of uh, teachers. Um, apart from that, at institutional level, uh, basically, um, um, I mean, at the policy level, what what were the changes uh, made at uh, Marian College? I think Father will be able to answer it. Father, please. Uh, Father, you have muted. Father, you have muted. Yeah, maybe uh, we'll together try to answer. Um, one of the things I, I just thought, I think is very important is the organizational commitment. See, from top to bottom, everybody. One thing which we did was we took a lot of time to implement this. Uh, therefore, a lot of discussions were happening. So the, at the top level, the management has management decided to go ahead for go ahead with uh, outcome-based education. And then we secondly we trained a couple of our own faculties. Dr. Minu was actually leading the movement at Marian. Um, he was one among them. And then we few other faculty members. I, I remember Dr. Chakochan was there. Um, our uh, some, some of the students even were there. So we bought a group of team to implement uh, outcome-based education in Marian. And then um, we started giving training sessions for faculty members. We also, in, in few occasions, included student volunteers to come and talk to them 
how they found it easy. And then when we thought, okay, more or less uh, our faculty members are capable of designing it perfectly well or near perfection, um, we implemented that. So the, the I remember the initial phase, one department, entire department, including one of the retired principals of that particular department, came running to the principal uh, and said, this cannot work. This is something blah, blah in the uh, US and is not suitable to India. And before, after implementing within an year, the same person came and said, actually, we should have done it much earlier. Um, she was actually a principal in another college, worked more than 30 years in different colleges. And then this is our experience. So initial hurdle, somehow we may have to overcome through persuasion and all that. However, after implementing, vast majority of the teachers found it extremely useful and more student involvement. Maybe, Minister, you can add to that. Just an audio check. Am I audible now? Yeah, ma'am, you are audible. So, so. Thank you. Sorry for the yeah, thank you. You are Thank you. Audible. You are audible. Yes, thank yes. So just a time check with the organizers since we have been delayed by a lot of technical glitches. Can you just tell me, uh, you know, the time so that I can uh, proceed? Uh, may, Madam, another 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I uh, begin with uh, what has been done by the previous two uh, speakers. And building on that, I, you know, build on the question that Dr. Sony asked, you know, what is the roadmap uh, for OBE, uh, outcome-based education? And, and when he just began the introduction of the session, Dr. Sony also mentioned that there have been a lot of, you know, workshops conducted on uh, CO, PO, PSO designing, but somewhere in the grassroots level, there is that miss that we find. So what I will try to do in the next 20 minutes, uh, that we will try to address outcome-based education at a philosophical level, at the level of its philosophy, understanding the philosophy of what outcome-based education is. And to help us do that, what I will uh, try and do is, all of us are aware of Bloom's taxonomy and backward design, which is a very, very popular uh, framework used for outcome-based education. So what I will try and do is that I will try and interview both of these, Bloom's taxonomy and backward design, so that we are able to build that fundamental foundation and facilitate uh, uh, outcome-based education in your institution. So normally what happens is when you are asked to design your POs, PSOs, COs, uh, some uh, lack of uh, that uh, thinking is observed by many institutions and many, you know, subject experts. So we will try and see if we build that fundamental, that foundation uh, to be able to understand outcome-based education at its fundamental level, that will help us or that will ease out the framing of uh, POs, PSOs and COs. So this is going to be the objective of uh, the next 20 minutes. Uh, I will start by this one word, education, since uh, outcome-based education certainly is focusing on education. And I would just like you, since there is paucity of time, I would just like you to, uh, in your mind, see what are the first thoughts that come to your mind when you look at this word as academicians across uh, India. So what are those first thoughts that come to your mind when you look at this word, education? And what I aim at right now is to simplify the way we understand this word education. I know there will be a lot of responses. You can put your responses in the chat box. And uh, normally the responses that, uh, that, that are received are, you know, education is uh, helping your students uh, develop or, you know, making your students be the best version of themselves or giving knowledge to your students. So there will be an array of uh, responses that will come. But to be able to you know, move ahead with outcome-based education, let us just simplify the meaning of education 
by saying that it is just nothing but learning. Education is just learning. So this is the fundamental understanding that we need to have or we need to redefine in terms of understanding education in a very, very simplistic way. So we are viewing it in a very simple way that education is just learning. You don't know how to cook food. You are, you know, you are uh, trying to learn. So that is also education. You don't know how to drive a vehicle and you are trying to do that. That is also education. So this certainly uh, slightly changed understanding of uh, education. That is, it is just learning will help us to understand that education is not molding the learner the way you want that your student should be, but it is organizing the natural longing to learn of all students that you are associated with. These are some basics that if we as academicians are able to absorb them and exhibit them in our classrooms daily, it will help us immensely to make outcome-based education, something very, very natural in our educational uh, scenarios. So if we say that education is something very natural, you see a small child and you will see that it is very difficult to stop them. They want to know the how, why, how this happens, what is done to this, why do we do this? So you know that learning is something very natural and something which is natural should be joyful. And uh, so to say, when you're hungry and you get a, a nice meal, you feel very happy. When you're thirsty and you get something nice to drink, you feel very happy. Similarly, as academicians, we need to reorient the way we you know, present our uh, educational frameworks or our educational uh, classrooms to our children. And we transform it into ways which make them joyful. Now, what do we need to do if we say or if we realign the way we think education as, that it is a natural process, we need to aid our students, we need to help them and we need to guide them basically. And we need to be those reflective practitioners who facilitate learning. And I think this, with this uh, renewed understanding, I would just take you to uh, the Bloom's taxonomy, which is uh, the other foundation stone of outcome-based education. Now, this is the original taxonomy that you see in terms of uh, levels of understanding. And you uh, see that it is a pyramid. And as you move up, you see that narrow peak where you have your students evaluate or synthesize. Let us move further uh, to this and say that uh, the ones in blue are actually the lower order thinking skills. And the ones in the other shade are the higher order thinking skills. Now, as educational Systems have evolved, the digital technology has taken over, Bloom's taxonomy has also evolved. And you, uh, some of you might be aware that in 2001, uh, Anderson and Crothwell, they uh, revised the taxonomy. And what was done was that action verbs were introduced into the taxonomy. And, you know, uh, remember, understand, so knowledge became remember, understanding became comprehension, and application become apply, became apply. But the taxonomy remained a pyramid where you have that narrow peak and uh, the 2001 action work taxonomy actually is what uh, uh, Dr. Binu was uh, specifying that when you are making your course outcomes, you need to make course outcomes which are measurable. You cannot say that my student, you know, is able to understand this or comprehend this. You need to say my student is able to define this. My student is able to differentiate between this or describe this. So this is basically the fundamental on which what he was saying actually rests. But again, you, uh, you know, find that there is that pyramid where you have uh, the very, very small peak. Now, based on this, if uh, you were asked to design a course, if I say that you design a course on, say, artificial intelligence or digital marketing, whatever it be, whatever subject area you come from, what are the first things that come to your mind? The first things that come to your mind are, you know, what are the topics that I need to include? What are the subtopics, the interrelated topics? And it is basically a hierarchy of topics which cross your mind. What happens with this is that you know that your student uh, is to, I, I really appreciate this graphic. Your student's mind is an empty vessel. And you know, you have all those topics in your mind and you are trying to fill that empty vessel with the topics that you have already for that uh, artificial intelligence course or the digital 
marketing course, whatever you have been teaching. But what happens in this framework, which is the traditional framework or which is the framework which, you know, which happens most of the time is that knowledge is transferred. But the central question arises where the student is required to use it apart from clearing an exam. And then both of us, the two teacher and the student, we land ourselves into an exam pitfall. So what happens is that our students have been uh, you know given the classroom experiences of uh, maybe remembering or understanding and when we take that exam we find that when the answers uh, ma come madam back, your your screen is not visible mm, madam your screen is not visible the ppt is not visible i mean i mean your ppt It is saying that the host has disabled screen sharing. You will have to enable the screen sharing for me. No, it is it is on, madam. You can you can share your screen. Sorry again, but that is the prompt that I am getting again. Host disabled participant. Have I joined as a participant? I think you need to upgrade me. You know, with the the panelist. I think that is the issue. Because from here, the prompt that I'm getting is, yeah, now it has been enabled. Yeah. So yes, rightly one participant has said that Madam is assuming that the slides are visible, but they are not. So I apologize the inconvenience. Technology certainly has uh, challenges. So this was the graphic that I was referring to, uh, you know, uh, where uh, we have those topics and uh, so, you know, maybe uh, the kind of impact that should have happened has not happened because the slides were not visible. So let us uh, anyway try and uh, you know, move ahead. So this is actually the scenario where we find that uh, our students are at those uh, lower order skills. And when you give them an exam and when the papers come back, normally what happens is that we say that students have not done as per my expectation. You know, I, I, I gave them everything so well. I was so clear. I gave them all the notes. But when the exam papers come back, this is a very, very common phenomena that all of us experience is that students have not performed as per our expectation. Now, to overcome this, uh, what I would uh, like you to look at is a certainly renewed version of how blooms can be used in our classrooms. Now you see the pyramid has been converted into a wedge where you see that there is that broad base of knowledge where you are making your students remember, understand and apply. But there is that broad top where you are giving equal importance to higher order skills of analyzing, evaluating and creating in your classroom experiences. And that is what is actually required for making your students get hooked to the courses that you are offering. So this is basically a very, very important understanding that we need to take in terms of using blooms in the current scenario where we are talking about outcome-based education. And if you see the evolution of blooms from the traditional framework, like uh, Dr. Bean showed, you know, how two classrooms uh, in the 2000 BC up till now look almost the same. I think the the solution lies in the way we evolve these taxonomies that are stepping stones or guiding frameworks for us. So instead of that pyramid where you have that narrow peak, where you give very less time to your students, yeah, we do have uh, challenges of, you know, completing the syllabus and the semester getting over. But then the way you plan your classroom experiences makes the difference. So if you plan your classroom experiences in ways where you give those opportunities and you give that time to your students to analyze, evaluate, and create, I think it will be a stepping stone in outcome-based education because now the new approach to course design, now if I ask you what, uh, you know, if you are to design a course on artificial intelligence and digital marketing, the first questions, the set of questions that should cross your mind is, what are my students going to learn? What are the ways in which their knowledge is going to be applied? And then you will slowly and systematically build this into your course 
and the course that you design will automatically be, I think, among the parameters of what outcome-based education requires. So uh, this is the fundamental understanding that we need to reorient or realign, so to say, to be able to you know, take outcome-based education in our uh, stride. One very, very powerful uh, model that I look at, which institutions or maybe subject teachers can adopt uh, to implement outcome-based education is backward designing. Backward designing is a very, very you know, powerful model uh, used internationally. So let us try, uh, since there's 10 minutes left, I'll have to rush. So uh, let us look at how backward designing is a very powerful tool to implement outcome-based education. So backward designing technically is a model which looks at the first thing that you do is you identify the desired results that you want in your program or the program outcome that we spoke about. What do I want my students to learn when they leave my course? Or what do I want my students to, you know, the skills that they should have when they leave my program or course? So that is the first step. The second is you determine the evidences that you will accept that they have learned what you uh, what you wanted them to, and then plan your classroom experiences. So let us look at these steps quickly, and you know try and see what they uh, have. The first is identify the desired result that you want. Like, what do you want your student? You want your student to have an understanding of what the subject is all about, or the skills that you want the student to have. So maybe if you are designing a course say in biotechnology and you want that your core, your student has the understanding of distinguishing between strong scientific experiments and weak ones. So that will be your first uh, broad goal where you will say that I want my students to have that understanding that this is a strongly developed scientific experiment and this is a weakly developed scientific experiment. So that is your broad goal. And then based on that broad goal, you build on those smaller objectives where you design your experiments in, in that way, you design your hypothesis and then you revise. So this is how the first step, uh, when we look at, you know, when we receive a syllabus, the first step is that with the syllabus, when I take the syllabus to my students, what is it that I want my students to learn when I complete the syllabus? And when you are able to identify this, it is very important to interweave this with a taxonomy like we just discussed, interweaving uh, with blooms and identifying the level of understanding so that the course outcomes that you, uh, that you design in the end are measurable as Dr. Bean. I really appreciate that point. And you know, it struck me that you, the, the course outcomes that you design should be measurable. And that will happen when you are able to interweave this taxonomy with the outcome that you want and then apply the action verb that you want your students to be able to list, something as simple as just listing something, something as simple as classifying something, applying, comparing. So you need to you know, uh, interweave both these things to be able to uh, do that justified uh, designing of your course outcomes. So uh, you have those broad goals and you have this taxonomy and based on that you have made your smaller objectives and then based on that you make your course outcomes and you specify what your student will do will be able to do in terms of the levels of uh, taxonomies that we just uh, saw so this is how you know the first uh, step of identifying the desired result in terms of backward designing is used the second step in backward designing is once you have determined what you want your students to do, what is going to be the evidence that you will accept that your students are learning or your students are on that pathway? So for that, you need to develop those assignments and those parameters of assessments which you are going to use to see whether you and your students are on the right track. To encapsulate this, this is something very, very broad. To encapsulate this in, in the Indian scenario, normally assignment is a very, very popular uh, means of you know, uh, measuring. So I will just quickly discuss with you the anatomy of a well-given assignment. Normally, as teachers, when we receive an assignment, we say this is a very, very well-written assignment by the student. 
but how often have we seen that whether the assignment is well given or not so here is uh, just a framework or a heuristic that may be used uh, to see whether your assignment is well given so the assignment uh, should contain a preamble of uh, why you need the, that assignment right now, the justification where you are right now in your course and justifying why you need that assignment, the mission in the assignment, the task and the submission format. So this is basically what a well-given assignment looks like. So I have an example here where you see your learning outcome stated and the preamble stating we are, this is an assignment example of uh, sampling probability given to research methodology students. So we are telling them why we need the assignment right now. And then what is the mission of the assignment? So we are telling them that this is what we want them to do. And we want them to maybe scan something, summarize something. So you see the tasks here are clearly defined. And we are also telling them what, you know, what is a good read for them. And then finally, clear cut instructions of how you want your students to submit. So these are clear cut instructions of how you want them to submit, what is the, you know, uh, the format, uh, word limit. So these are all parts which need to be paid, uh, you know, uh, uh, good attention to be able to have that complete package, so to say, of outcome-based education. So this is just an example. Moving ahead, assignment uh, on the assignment, uh, this thing, Grading is something very, very important, which drives your students to, you know, how they take your assignment, whether they take your assignment seriously or not. Very often as uh, teachers, you, you and even I have been guilty of just marking students at flair. Oh, I like this. So I give them, you know, say a 20 out of uh, 25. Uh, I like this even more. So a 23 out of 25. I don't like this one. So it is 15 out of 25. But don't you think that that is a little unfair because, you know, you did not tell your students what you wanted in the first place. And after that, we are judging them on the flair. So this is just like, you know, not telling the rules of the game and then saying that, you know, you played well or you did not play well. So uh, to overcome this, I think it is very important that in outcome-based education, rubric designing is, you know, made an indispensable part. So here you can see that in a 24 marks assignment, we are clearly say, stating what are the ways in which we have divided. Uh, so this is a division based on six, six marks each. So uh, the first six marks, if you are getting a zero, why are you getting a zero? If you're getting a two, why two, why four and why six? And similarly, the next six marks are allotted for something like this and the remaining six marks for something like six. So this is something uh, which, uh, you know, uh, gives your students that uh, sense of, uh, you know, uh, clarity that there has been no prejudice done. Uh, there is no decision done just on a random basis that I got to 20, you got 15, she got 23, and, uh, you know, somebody else got 24. So that arbitrary way of evaluation has to go if we, you know, want to take up outcome-based education in its uh, full as a full package so uh, uh, assignment design is also i think a very very important component of uh, this uh, madam, ma madam uh, can you finish it in two minutes yeah two minutes okay fair enough so i think then we can open yeah. it to questions yeah yeah so because i think uh, then opening it to questions would be the best way to finish in two minutes so if there are any questions I think uh, we can wind it up like that. So if there are any no, questions. There are no. Just a minute. No, no questions. Uh, madam, I, I have a question. Uh, so while going through uh, profile I could understand that so you are an expert in uh, w the creation of uh, value added courses and uh, add-on courses so do you have a mechanism to measure the outcomes um, I mean for the value added courses and uh, um, certificate courses and other add-on courses uh, value added courses right now in our institution are uh, on a credit uh, basis framework so we have a two-phased uh, scheme of measuring them 
One is the basis of the time spent by the student in terms of the credit that they take. And the second is the, the as I showed you, uh, the assignments, you know, the assignments and the practical uh, aspects that we take the students or the students are supposed to submit. So those are very, very clearly written. Like I just showed you, uh, I ran through rather quickly in terms of how a well given assignment uh, has to be done. So in our value added courses, we take that special care where the assignments are complete clear and comprehensive and I think that is something which helps us to evaluate and measure that our students are actually doing what we wanted them to do because value added courses certainly focus on you know the skill sets that the student will acquire uh, the skill sets that uh, the students will acquire so to match the measurement of those skill sets we have very very clearly written uh, you know assignments so I hope that answers. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, a lot of positive, uh, encouraging comments are coming. But due to lack of time, uh, we need to finish. Um, I understand, I understand uh, that, <laughs> um, uh, Dear participants, we, had, we got th three um, very informative session. Uh, sessions, in fact, um, Dr. Rupali was going through how Bloom's taxonomy can be uh, implemented in uh, higher education institutions and, in fact, in classrooms. Uh, she has suggested a reverse engineering kind of uh, thing to um, implement Bloom taxonomy and outcome-based education uh, in higher education institutions. Uh, and Father was talking about the evolution of uh, outcome-based education in in India, um, he was uh, talking about the Washington Accord and the consensus um, among different nations. And Dr. Dr. Binu has explained how the vision and the mission of the college can be translated into program-specific objectives, uh, program educational objectives, course uh, outcomes, etc. So we got different dimensions of this particular theme in this uh, panel uh, panel discussion. I, I thank all the um, panelists and uh, participants for attending this program. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That was indeed a very enlightening discussion. A big thank you to the panelists and also to Dr. Sony Kuriakos. As we are nearing the end of the two-day conference, uh, we have Dr. Jasmine Jos, Assistant Professor of English, Dharmala College, Moatura, and the convener of the conference to address the gathering for vote of thanks. Thank you. Respected Principal Dr. Thomas K. V., uh, Vice Principal Professor Emmanuel A. J., Bursa Father Francis Kanaden, IQVC Coordinator Dr. Sony Kuriakos, Fellow convener, Dr. Dino Alexander, dear faculty members, research scholars, other invitees, and attendees of the conference. A very good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of the internal quality assurance cell of Namilla College and state level quality assurance cell of Government of Kerala, I take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the immense hard work done by quiet a large number of brains and hands to make this conference a resounding success. First, I take this opportunity to thank the National Assessment and Accreditation Council for accepting and uh, rendering all the support and guidance for making this possible. Thank you. Next, uh, I thank State Level Quality Assurance Cell uh, Government of Kerala uh, for the collaboration and guidance for the successful conduct of this program. Next, I thank our management uh, for, the, uh, for the continuous support uh, throughout the program, uh, especially our manager, uh, Monsignor Pais Malekandadil, and uh, Bursa Father Francis Kanaden. Thank you, Fathers. And 
Uh, our Vice Principal, Dr. Thomas K.B., uh, has rendered us liberal support by constant and effective interventions. He always stays as a firm source of inspiration for us. Uh, thank you, sir, for all the fervors you have given right from the beginning of this program. Next, I thank our Vice Principal, Professor Emmanuel A.J., uh, for volunteering his time and for his timely supports. We acknowledge our heartfelt gratitude to you also, sir. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Sony Kuriakos, the captain of the IQAC of Nimala, for coming up with this idea and also for his complete dedication for the successful conduct of this conference. He has always made sure that uh, we are on the right track and made this an easy journey for us. Thank you, sir. Next, I thank the twin convener, Dr. Dino Alexander, who, uh, who was always on the go. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am, for your vibrant attitude and exquisite hard work. I also thank the crew members, Dr. Jijo Vijay, Dr. Albin Paul, Dr. Gina Josh, Dr. Anjali Joseph, Mr. Linto Joseph, Mr. Prince Samuel, and Mr. Augustine Benny for voluntarily taking up all the toils and struggles. Thank you all. We acknowledge and appreciate all the efforts you have taken to make this uh, possible today. Thank you all again. A special thanks to Ms. Anujoy Chambirati, Ms. Diya Matthew, and Dr. Rajesh Kumar B. Uh, we also owe special gratitude to Mr. Sibi and Mr. Manu for the technical support. And uh, finally, it has been a tribute to host a diverse group of participants, including principals, vice principals, IQAC coordinators, uh, faculty members, academicians, and scholars from different institutions from different states on last two days. And we have received around more than uh, 700 registrations, and most of them have joined and participated on both the days. And uh, I thank all the participants for your positive response and active participation. Thank you all once again. Uh, hope you have come to grip with NAP and its uh, intricacies with these two days. Finally, I conclude by thanking the Lord Almighty for bringing us all together to make this a resounding success. Once again, thank you all. Once again, a big thank you to all the dignitaries and participants.